I hope you enjoyed getting to know the Briners throughout part one. A lot of their story leading to them being married and having a family. Get ready right now for part two because you're going to hear a spiritual journey which has a bit of twist and turns that I don't think either of these guys were expecting. Y'all are tuned in to part two. You learned a little bit about uh, about Steve and Tamara. And I'm even thinking about what kind of be real, be real. We'll edit in. Maybe I'll challenge you to a pre contest or something like that. We did do some jumping jacks earlier, did we not? <laughs> oh, it was wonderful. <laughs> so Breathing if you're exercises. If you're wondering why we're so energetic, it has nothing to do with cold caffeinated beverages. Hey, do you know what the difference is between a good Mormon and a bad Mormon? The temperature of their caffeine. Oh, <laughs> there, yes. we, there we go. go. <laughs> Steve, so, so we've taken people up to the point to where it's like, hey, Briners now united five, five of oh, five in the Bountiful Temple. Steve, you you shared with me before you were on a spiritual journey to where the things of the world ended up being unsatisfying and a humbling experience. Yeah. What, what continued to happen in your your young adult, your young married life? Did you feel yourself developing spiritually? I felt absolutely nothing spiritually. Um, I, you know, you think you think that getting entering into the celestial kingdom has to do with scaling the hierarchy of the Mormon Church, and you think that okay, I need to be successful. I need to make lots of money for the Lord so I can go on missions. I need to. I need to become a bishop. I need to become a stake president so that someday I can be called to be a mission president. And those are all these things that I'm thinking about about my life and that, that I need to make happen. It's not the Lord. It's me. It's inside me. That yeah, Tamar, did you recognize that's how he was viewing things? Yeah, and I would say I viewed the same. Like, <laughs> it's on me. Like, I'm the one who's got to make stuff happen. And, yeah, I can mm -hmm. do that. Okay. So you felt nothing, even though you're you're remaining active in church, aren't you? Oh yeah, we're totally active. We go at, we go every single Sunday. Yeah, I was. Wow, oh, had a lot of callings. I was in the Ward Young Men's Presidency. I was in the Stake Young Men's Presidency. I was the Elders Quorum President. Um, we can talk, we should get together and swap Elders Quorum President <laughs> stories sometime, Jacob. Um, Elders Quorum President, uh, Ward Mission Leader. Um, yeah, I I I was in. I was I attended Ward Council for probably like eight years straight every single week and saw everything, all of the goings on that happened in there. And, and I was for all intents and purposes, I was, I was climbing up. I was how, making my way up the ladder. How did you recognize the lack of spiritual progress? Oh, there was just nothing. I just, I had so many questions. First of all, things that didn't make sense. I felt like I would go to these meetings. I would go to ward council and leave to just, I would leave just, completely and absolutely de-energized like nothing i felt nothing i was like what are we doing here why do we talk about the same exact people every single week they don't want to come to church and i mean it's fine to be friends with them but why are we talking about these people every single week they don't i don't, I don't understand why we're doing this week after week after week um those are my thoughts in the church and as far as spiritually <sighs> man i I, I, and a lot of this is my, most of this is my fault. I wasn't seeking Christ. I was seeking the church. I was seeking callings. I was seeking to be seen of men. I wasn't reading the Book of Mormon. We weren't doing anything spiritually as a family. We prayed once a night together, and that was all we did. And, yeah. Do you have anything to add? Yeah. yeah no. how, how are you feeling during that time? In other words, this, it sounds like this is the first number of years after being married, it sounds like that, that sort of spiritual emptiness, you were feeling it as kids are entering the home. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, and I could, I saw a lot of his frustration and, and, you know, he would voice stuff. So I knew what he was feeling and, and, you know, I, I was feeling similar. Like I'd say to him a lot, I'd be like, can I just go on active? Like, would you be okay with that? <laughs> like, can I just stop? Um, but yeah, with me, I don't know. There'd always, I'd always had some questions and things that, just nobody could give me an answer to. What were some of those? Uh, some some questions like pertaining to the plan of salvation. Um, polygamy was a big one for you. Why don't you one. tell tell how you well, felt about Joseph Smith and polygamy? Yeah, like I I knew Joseph. I had a testimony that Joseph Smith was a prophet because I knew the Book of Mormon was true and and I could see the fruits of that. Like I knew that he was a prophet, but I just didn't like him. I could not like him um, because of polygamy. 
Like, yes, I can accept he was a prophet. I can accept he, he was called of God. I know that, but that doesn't mean I have to like him, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And so those were kind of my feelings. And, you know, and I knew I wasn't alone in that because, you know, How growing did you know up, you weren't alone in that? Well, growing up, um, once I started going into Relief Society and, you know, number of times when polygamy would be being talked about, there would always be somebody who would be like, you know, I, I always had a really hard time with polygamy or polygamy was really hard for me to get over or it was really hard for me to accept polygamy. And so I knew that this was, you know, it wasn't just me. Yeah. There were other people out there who like struggled it's, with it's it. It's been that way <laughs> since is, <laughs> I'll, I'll leave, I'll, I'll keep my commentary different, but I know it's been a struggle <laughs> since the inception of polygamy in the church. Yeah. And so I, I felt like, well, maybe this is just, maybe I just don't have enough faith. Maybe I need to have more faith and then just be able to accept it. Or maybe this is just something I just, I won't think about now and I'll just put it away. But, um, so those were kind of my feelings, um, with that. And uh, yeah, again, there, the, I just still had some of those feelings of guilt. Like I, I felt like, I needed to be doing something like I didn't feel like I really had the spirit with me that much. I didn't, I, I knew Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ were there, but I didn't necessarily feel a close connection and I didn't know how to connect with them except by going to church and yeah. doing the, th like, that's all I knew. And, and I, you know, I, I didn't. There's something comforting yeah. when there, when there's an established pattern or tradition that we can follow. Oh, that's going to get me what I want. Yeah. And Listen to conference talks, go to yeah, church. Yeah. yeah. And 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 like Steve, I won't admit, like I wasn't reading my scriptures as regularly regularly as I could. And that was another thing, like with the scriptures, I I loved the scriptures, but it gets to a point where it's just like, Yeah, I know the stories. Like yeah. you know, you're not really getting yeah. very much more out of it. Um, and it's kind of well, I gotta read it. I need to read it because that's what I'm supposed to do. So I'll read my chapter. And if I don't read my chapter, I'll feel guilty. If I read it, I won't feel guilty. Did you ever feel, well, let me ask this. Well, let me make a comment first. If this was a Mormon stories podcast, I would hopefully be leading you to a story about how you guys became atheists and became so go. much happier yeah. as atheists. We're out of the church and we don't believe Jesus is real, at least not in that same way. And that's certainly not what happened to you guys. No, no. not at all. Steve, go back to where, okay, so you recognize an emptiness. What did you do about this emptiness? I know that you mentioned your mission president earlier. Did he play a part in this? He played a big part uh, before that. Well, to try and fill, even before the mission president, before the mission president, um, I started filling it with that void with worldly things. I started getting into things that other people were into go like, sports team yeah, there you go 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 ball ball go carry the ball as far as you can carry it and then oh kick the ball two dozen and, men in matching yep, pajamas yep, exactly. uh, throwing a sack of wind all of that that's all of so that. manly yeah and i like well, there's I, something fun when there's an excuse to get together with other dudes and have nachos it, it be, was something fun. to be said yeah, for it was it. fun yeah, it, it was. was fun um i i honestly don't care about it anymore at all but for a while there for years i mean from 2012 to 2016. I mean, I was so into football. I, I'd never been in, I'd never would watched football. Would you memorize stats and things like that? Oh yeah, I would watch, I would follow all the NFL teams. I would I would watch him, I'd cheer for him. I'd get into the playoffs, not just the playoffs, but every Sunday, every Sunday I would come home and turn off the NFL. Every, turn on the NFL, every single Sunday after church. I was like, well, my two hours, my three hours are done. And, and here's, the, here's the amazing thing. Most people, when, they, when they're examining from from the perspective of an active member of the church, what are the false gods we worship? Football. Yes. I, I think you'd agree, yes, but yeah. there's more to it than that. Okay, so it wasn't fulfilling. How long did you go down that path, and what made you say, I got to do something about this? There was probably four years of going down that path of filling the void with worldly things. Dude, those three words, filling the void. Yeah. And so, in other words, rather than getting something that's that's actually enduring, fulfilling. We just want to fill the emptiness, fill, fill the, the void. void. Yep, and that's what I was doing. It was video games. And yet and void was not filled. No, void was not filled. Yeah, video games, movies, football, um, yeah, whatever else, whatever else there was. I don't even remember, but um, mostly mostly those things. Call of Duty? Call of Duty. I never really got into okay, Call of Duty. I like those ones with headshots. Yeah. So. And I still, you know, I still do play some video games here and there, you know, maybe 
once a year. I look forward to it at Christmas time, okay. a couple days. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, it's not it's not every Sunday like it, like like back then. Now during this time, it, it, Dammers expressed that she would read kind of out of a sense of duty. Oh, were you reading your scriptures? I was never reading. And I didn't know. Were you reading? Really? I'd read every now and then. When Would I you? felt guilty, I'd start reading. Uh. <laughs> yeah, and it was that act. It was. It's the act of reading, of just picking it up and reading your chapter that gets in 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 my eyes that got you into the celestial kingdom because you you, you know? had already experienced the testimony of the book of mormon yeah. that it truly is a witness of jesus christ yeah. how and now it's going years without reading am i understanding you Eight, right 18 years 18? yeah 18 years Bef- i mean i thought you were going to say four no, now i really need to be careful i i would pick it up i would pick it up here and there i mean i would take it to church and pick it up here and there and read very very sporadically but without any feeling without just because I felt guilty, just because that's what I needed to do, was read it to get into the celestial kingdom. In my mind, that's what I needed to do. That it was that act of reading. It was that act of going to church. It was that was what was going to get me into the celestial kingdom. Mm. So got a list that I could show. Yeah, yeah, got a list. Heavenly Father, yep. in case you didn't read my resume, yeah. And I was doing like I did my home teaching during this time. You know, I was really one of the few ones that did it. But I would go did, and I would do it. Was there any signs that? Anybody was concerned about your lack of spiritual progress it, outside? In, in other words, when you think about the the Ward family and those that you're associated with in the church, um, I don't think so. It, it it seems like it's kind of a foregone conclusion. Oh, they're here every Sunday and they have a calling. Therefore, we're okay. Yeah, yeah. I did. At I least did. Not in my case. Maybe in- well, I I did have. I did. I went for about six months without a temple recommend because th- that was another. That was something we need to talk about. Yeah, I went for about six months without a temple recommend, and. Because I was like, I don't understand this. I don't want to go. I have no desire to go to the temple. I don't understand why we're doing it. I don't understand every, anything that goes on in there. And I would ask people and they'd be like, well, we don't know either. We just go and do it. <laughs> and, and yeah. you know, my bishop, this, my bishop, his name was, his name is Russ. He's a, he's a great guy. I really love him. And he, um, I went to him and I, he was actually a counselor in the bishopric at the time. And I said, I don't understand this. Like, I, I dare say this. I hate the temple. Like, I can't stand it. I hate going. And, and he said... Did he pull up his crucifix and throw holy no, water in you? he said, all he said was, you know, we're told... This was during a temple recommend interview. And I'd answered all the questions, right? You know, I was still paying tithing and all that. And, and, and he said, you know, we're told... Were his exact words... We are told that we're not told that we need to go to the temple. We're told that we just need to have we told that we we're told that we need to have a recommend. And that was actually super, super good advice. Like I'm grateful for his those were words of wisdom to me. And and I'm grateful for him and his wisdom. And then I went to my stake president and expressed the same thing. And I said, I don't understand the temple. I don't get it. I don't like going. And he said, Well, why don't you try going one more time this year than you went last year? And again, like two great leaders. That's a simple commitment. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Both my stake president and my bishop were great leaders and gave me great advice, and I'm grateful to them to this day. And I did. I, I hadn't been to the temple in years and years and years, and I got that temple recommend, and I went one more time to the temple, just like he, he his advice said. And... That seriously, that one time made a lot of difference, made a huge deal in my life. Did you notice anything start to stick out from the temple, an additional lesson that you learned? Um, well, that one time, um, I wanted to understand it. I didn't understand it. I wanted to understand what we were doing. Like, what does all this stuff mean? It has to have some sort of meaning. It didn't make any sense to me. And so that's, we talked about my mission president. That's where, this is where he comes in. I knew I thought of him and I had a good relationship with him and I had maintained contact with him uh, since the end of my mission. And um, he, I knew that he had been on like eight temple missions all over the world. Jeez Louise. Yeah, since, since I, since we'd both come home from Argentina. So I thought, you know, if there's anybody that can talk to me about the temple, it's him. So I thought of him. So I contacted him and I said, look, can we go to the temple together and, do an endowment session and then I really want you to talk to me about the temple. I really don't understand it and I really need, I really want to understand it and understand what it all means. And he said, absolutely. Yeah, let's do that. And, um, 
uh, we that started an awesome relationship where for the next three years, we went every single month together. And we'd go down in the cafeteria and we would talk. He was a poetry professor. We would talk about poetry. We would talk about the temple. We would talk about symbolism. And God, oh, that taught me. That taught me so much. Like it was like Karate Kid. Like just, <laughs> I learned how. I was learning how to actually read. How he was teaching me poetry, and in poetry, just as in scripture, every single word matters. And if the word is plural versus singular, I mean, every single word matters. And that's what that's what that taught me in those three years is understanding symbolism and how to read. And it was just it was just an awesome experience, and I'm just so grateful for it. And um, how long was this going on for? That went on for three years. That okay. went on from 2017 to 2020. Like like a once a month sort of thing. Once a month, mm-hmm. yeah, always once a month. And you know, we could talk about that. She was actually, you know, why don't we back up? Why don't we back <laughs> up? So, um, she. Um, we were we were awakening. Can I back up and and yeah yeah we were we were we were beginning to awaken at this time and uh, pr- prior to you reaching out yeah, to your mission prior president. to prior to me reaching out to the and, mission and how do you how do you recognize an awakening happening? Oh man, what did it feel like to you? Well, I it was kind of Steve taking the lead with it, so I was noticing changes in him um, and things that he was doing, and he would share things that he learned with me, and as he would share things with me it helped me to kind of have my own awakening. <laughs> like, I'd be like, oh my gosh, I, I don't know what you want to get into right now, but. Um. Well, so what are, the, what are these things that you're awakening to? Um, well, the first thing, the first thing, what, were you going to say something? No, you go first. Okay. Well, the first thing we awakened to, the first thing I personally awakened to was the Book of Mormon. I'd been re- I hadn't been reading it for 18 years. And I mean, like I said, it's very sporadically here and there. You're, you're working it, on filling yeah, the void. Yeah, you're avoiding the, void. the yep. there's a term that I learned and tell me if this applies, kick against the pricks. Oh, I, asked, yes. I asked a buddy of mine what that means because he's a Bible scholar. And you, you think about a, there might be a shepherd leading the animals who would have a stick with a little point at the end so he can give a prick over here to keep them guided on the right path. Yeah. And to kick against the pricks would be to fight against the promptings of the spirit is what it translates to. Yeah, that's, that's exactly, I would say that's exactly what I was doing. I mean, the spirit was pushing me this whole time and I was filling it with Babylon. And so it came to a point, I was dang near atheist. I was like, I don't even know if I believe in God anymore. I don't believe in Jesus Christ. I don't, I just don't believe in anything because nothing is happening for me. There's no answers in any of this. I don't understand the planet. One of the things I would always say is, you know, what you're telling me that I'm going to come down here and I'm going to watch Netflix and I'm going to watch some football and I am going to die and go up and all of a sudden I'm s- sitting as a god in the celestial kingdom like with with Abraham and with Peter who was crucified upside down with a Benedict who was burned like that's what you're telling me? Like I, I remember there was a um... There was a missionary in the Midwest with me, and he was the son of one of the uh, one of the general authorities who who later became an apostle. And he was, it, and you could tell that he felt a little bit lifted up because of his lineage yeah. of top level church leadership. And he liked to describe how much they loved their football. It, the thing, same things that you're describing, as far as the love of the distractions of the world, he almost had a, a sense of a. Uh, of loving acknowledgement of, yep, that's how they are. Yeah, yeah. I got super into BYU football, and I justified BYU football, dude. I justified it because it's the church, you know? Well, the mm-hmm. church, it's, I can get on board with this because I can worship this because it's the church. It's easy to feel good when it seems like, well, everybody else around me, they're going through the same thing, and they yeah. seem to be doing all right. Yeah, exactly. That's how I felt. And oh, where was I? What were we saying? So you're, you're recognizing, so I'm just going to come down here. I'm going to be watching oh, yeah. Netflix, playing yeah, some yeah, video yeah, games, yeah, doing all yeah, this. And then yeah. I get to inherit the celestial kingdom yeah. with all of the prophets of the scriptures. Yep. Yep. That's, that's, and I said that all the time yeah. to, to Tamara. I was yeah. like, I don't understand this. I, this is ridiculous to me. This does not make any sense. Okay. And she, and so, well, anyway, I, I kept getting these prompts right there in that hallway. I was, um, I was walking down that hallway one day and I was just like, I can't do this anymore. I cannot keep up this facade. It was just this facade of, of, uh, 
I, I don't know what to do. I don't believe in any of this, and none of it makes any sense to me, and I don't know what to do, and I can't keep it up anymore. Am I the only one saying these things? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so, so I, uh, what did I do at that point? Oh, I was like, you know what? I believe in God. I believe in God because I'm here, and this world is here, and I know this is not here by accident. There's no way this is just here. You know, it has to have a creator. And so I was like, okay, well, what do I do? What do I do at this point? And, you know, I, I prayed and I said, what, what should I do? What do you want me to do at this point? Do you want me to leave the church? What, what do you want me to do? And I got the prompting to pick up the Book of Mormon, pick up the Book of Mormon. And I got that prompting for months and months and months (laughs) before I did it. Okay. And it was just sitting, it's sitting right there on the bookshelf, you know. You think about how it seems like a a more difficult thing for you to simply maintain activity, fulfill callings, yeah. but cracking open the, the book, why do you think it was more difficult? I, I just because I, I, I'd read it before, you know, and I was like, I know the stories, just like what Tamara said. I know the stories. That's not going to do me any good, okay? I need some answers to questions, and... That's just stories, you know. I don't. That's not going to do me any good. So that was kind of my thought process, and I was like, "Why? Why do I need to open up this book? It's not going to do me. Not going to do me any good." And I fought that. You know, I fought that for months and months, until one night, you know, it was in January of 2017, and I just came in here, and I picked it up off of the bookshelf, and that bookshelf right there, and. I, it was in Spanish. It was a Spanish Book of Mormon. And I picked it up, and I kind of looked through it and opened up to First Nephi, First Nephi chapter 1, and I looked at the chapter heading, and then I read one word. I read the first word, and it's Joel, I. And I read it with purpose. I read it to know. I read it because I was, I was instructed by the Lord to read it, and boom, I knew. Like, I took it into the bedroom, and that's where I read the word, is in my bed. And I was like, this is true. This is true. This is it. I need to figure this out. I need to figure out the Book of Mormon. I need to figure out the temple. Okay. I need to do this. And I know I can do it with my Heavenly Father. And that was really what started the whole journey of, of, of awakening, if you want to call it. <sighs> And it it hit you. So why why do you believe now that it had that level of impact on you? Reading the one word. Well, I've I've thought a lot about that. Um, and again, it was because I I wanted to know. I read it with purpose, and it's not it's not so much in initially. It wasn't so much. It wasn't the words of the book. It was the act of picking the book up that's all it was and opening the pages that I haven't that I hadn't opened for so long to actually learn and with a th- with a thirst for knowledge that I wanted to know I had to know and it sounds like an act of contrition yeah that's exactly what it is what were you noticing at the time as he's going through this oh man <sighs> well after he had that experience it really changed <laughs> Change things up around here. He, in what way? He would, whereas before, you know, he'd go and watch, but he would spend like hours in the room reading the scriptures okay. and studying and, and, and. How are you interpreting Looking it? for things. And well, at first I'm like, what is going on? And then with me, you know, my natural is to kind of, well, now I'm feeling like I need to be doing that. <laughs> <laughs> and I wasn't, it was different because I wasn't having that same pool desire he was. And so it was still kind of like, oh, well, I need to be reading so I don't feel bad. And so, and I feel, and, at, and I'm At so this sh- point, well, let me ask, at what point, you're observing things about your husband. At what point did it ta- turn into you talking about things and recognizing, hey, we're, there's more light from God that's being offered to us? Yeah. Um, you know, he talked about going to the temple with his mission president and he would come back and share a lot of the things that he was learning and share things that they had been discussing and they would discuss scriptures as well. And um, so for me, I was beginning to notice, oh, they're 
there's more here. And, um, you know, there were some things that we discussed, um, like about the plan of salvation and different things that it just kind of blew my mind. It like, it was like a key turning, like all of a sudden, like things that had been confusing that I had had questions about all of a sudden they were answered and it was like, oh my gosh, it, it was like, I don't need, I, I just recognize this as truth. Like, this is what I've been looking for. This is what's been missing for me. What things felt most satisfying as you learned them? Or, or, or it, like, it went through that unlocking process where now it makes sense. It's, it's just like, I know, it, it's almost like you've had a puzzle with pieces missing and, and the pieces are put in place. And it's like, oh, I can, I can see it all now. I can make the connections that I need to make. And it's, it's, it's making sense. And so it just changed my whole view on things and I do feel I have to go back and kind of say um and I feel guilty about this this isn't putting me in the best light but when he (laughs) when he started going to the temple once a month with his mission president I kind of started getting a little jealous and a little like put out and and because we never went to the temple together never and it's not necessarily that I had a desire to go but I was like I I want you to want to go to the temple with me. And he's like, well, I'll go to the temple with you anytime you want. Just ask. And I'm like, well, no, I don't want to ask. I want you to want to go with me. <laughs> I like, think that's a natural <laughs> desire to say. <laughs> and so I was feeling a little jealous. And and so finally he's like, you can go to the temple anytime you want. Or if you want me to go, I'll go with you. And, and I was like, well, or you can go with a friend. And I'm like, well, I don't want to go with a friend. And I don't want to go with you unless you want to go with me. <laughs> and so... I'm like, I'm just going to go by myself. So I um, went to the temple by myself thinking, oh, this is going to make me feel better. And, you know, and, and I went and as I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, oh, I need to start going to the temple regularly now. And that's what I need to do because that's what Steve's doing. And as I sat there, I just had the realization. Um, it just came over me like, I don't like this. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't want to be doing this. And I kind of got the feeling like, that's okay. And I know that (laughs) that sounds weird, probably bad. But so for me, it kind of was like, all right, I don't have to feel like I have to go to the temple, do the same thing Steve is doing. I don't have to be doing the same things he's doing. And I went and, and I prayed while I was in the celestial room. And because one of the, my purposes in going was Steve was figuring out what he needed to do. And, and he was feeling called and pulled to do these things. And I was like, well, what, what about me? Like, what does the Lord want for me to do? Cause right now I was just trying to do everything Steve was doing yeah. thinking, Oh, that's what I need to be doing. Kind of that same pattern that we, yeah, cause <laughs> we, do, we do like to latch onto is somebody doing six, something successful around me. Let me follow that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I was very that's much natural. into that. And so I just went and prayed and basically was like, Heavenly Father, what do you want me to do? Like, what, what do I need to be doing? And I got the answer to be a mother. Like, you need to be a mother. And that was not what I was looking for. That was not what I was expecting. It kind of caught me off guard because I was, like, thinking, oh, it's going to be, you need to be going to the temple or you need to be fasting or you need to be, you know. um, But I I very much recognized that as an answer. I knew that that was an answer from, from the Lord. And I was like, and it just brought me so much peace. And I was like, okay, that's what I need to be doing. And that's, yes, I can recognize that I haven't, been doing that the way that I should have been and and so that so Tamara's getting instructions (laughs) regarding regarding her journey what she's supposed Mm to do you you couldn't fill the void with the distractions of the world you realize I'm not going to inherit the same kingdom as uh as the prophets of the scriptures by just uh, going through life the way that I see others around me what starts to fall into place or unlock as you've now humbled yourself to read the scriptures regularly and seek greater light and knowledge yeah, we started reading the scriptures. I started re- reading them regularly. We started reading them together for the first time as a family. I started blessing my family for the first time, blessing my children, blessing my wife. Um, we started having family prayer uh, as a family all the time. And <clears throat> I was going to the temple once a month. Um, let's see. What else? Oh, I was given a book. I was given a book by a friend, and the name of the book was called Teachings of the Doctrine of Eternal Lives. Ooh, ooh. And that was huge. That was mind, very mind-opening. And it's by an anonymous author who, and it's not even really, there's no 
author commentary. It's just a collection of quotes from early church leaders about what eternal lives is and what is the real plan of salvation. What does that look like? What is that? And it's very. it was a very primer, an introduction to that topic. And I started seeing all of these things in that book in the temple and in the Book of Mormon. And that was hugely eye-opening to both me and Tamara about what is, what did Joseph Smith teach that the plan of salvation was? Because it's not, you know, earth, two bubbles, and then another bubble, and then a there, wall, and then... There, there was a meme that I saw recently where it says, if you ask a Catholic, oh, uh, the what the plan of salvation is, they're going to take you over to this. And if you ask a Baptist, they're going to take you over to the scriptures. If you ask a Mormon, they're going to find the nearest chalkboard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And understanding that it was not that was enormous yeah, for the, both of us. That, and was, and it, that was the big thing for here, me. Here's what I'm noticing something. In, in prior years, the, the different struggle of, of trying to figure things out, there's a whole lot of uncertainty. Is this right? This doesn't feel right. This feels empty. It seems like now as you're becoming aware of holes in your knowledge, there's something comforting about it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, the more we realized, we, we thought we had it all. You know, we're like, we got a temple marriage. We got the family. We got the home. We got the callings. We got it all. We got it made in the shade. All we have to do is- Show up is, at the pearly gates yep, with this resume. Yep, here we go. Temple recommend and we're in. <laughs> And so we thought we had it all, and realizing that there was this enormous amount of knowledge and information that we didn't have was, yes, it was enormously comforting. What years is this? I mean, maybe somebody's listening to this in the future. Right now, it is uh, it is September 2021. When was this happening? This, this was this, all this whole, happening. This, there's a spiritual... Because let me give a recap of what I'm hearing from yeah. you. You recognize an infusion of the light of Christ in your life. You recognize, hey, I'm now having natural desires to learn more to study the scriptures. I'm hearing and recognizing promptings regarding being a mother or being a father, giving blessings and doing these things. I'm becoming aware of how much I don't know. And it sounds like you recognize there's more available to you and you're feeling confident you can find it. When is this happening? This is happening over a period of about three, three, four years, beginning in 2017, um, that's when I first opened the Book of Mormon. It's until, pretty recent. Yeah, up until about a year. Well, like you said, when we met, and I mean, I've been learning more and more and more, but yeah. um, then I really, well, yeah, up until about May of last year, 2020, mm-hmm. was when it kind of culminated, and I found, I fi- we finally found like, oh, this is it. This is where we need to be. This is what we've been looking for. Yeah. The Doctrine of Christ. Okay. And... Yeah, during that, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. You want, I, th- that's something significant because it does feel really good as a young missionary when you feel like, I've got the plan and I'm being sent out to a foreign land to give the plan unto others. Well, now you're decades later. Yeah. <laughs> and all of a sudden you feel like, I'm seeing the plan more clearly for the first time. Yeah. Hey, okay. so... You've been in the same ward the whole time, haven't you? Yeah, we've yes. been in the same ward. Your whole, yeah. <laughs> your whole married life is you, get, you don't bounce around like you used to back no. in the day. Yeah. <laughs> a little bit of stability. So how are things playing out now? Because you've, you've now got decades worth of history of, I'm going through the traditions that I'm used to being raised in the church here in the United States. Yeah. But now you're having an awakening. Did you try sharing it with it? Well, I'll tell you what, Steve, lead up to how you and I ended up meeting each other. Okay, yeah, we can talk about that. Um, so, end or beginning of 2020, um, you know, COVID, COVID hit. I was still going to the temple with my mission president, still searching. I mean, I had gotten, I had begun, um, I got to know the, the publisher of the book, Teachings of the Doctrine of Eternal Lives, and I was buying those. I was buying those just boxes. Giving them out. Yeah, yeah, I was giving them out to people, lo- lots of books. Um, just to try to get people interested again in the Book of Mormon, because I was seeing in the church, um, you know, not people would people were just like me, and but they wouldn't really pick up the Book of Mormon to study it and learn, and they may pick it up to read a bit because that reading it is what's going to get that checklist again. That's what's going to get them into the celestial kingdom, yeah. and so I I started, you know 
buying books from the publisher and and handing them out to people. And he started introducing me to other books that other people had written. And, and I read one called um, How to Have Your Second Comforter. And it was scary reading that book because the author of that book, he's an anonymous author, and he was talking about taking things like taking the sacrament in your house. Now, of course, you know, we did that for a year and a half now during COVID and it was just <laughs> fine. But that was scary reading about that in that book. I was like, I don't think I should be reading this. You know, it was just so scary. Um, was it just going against the traditions yeah, you were yeah, raised with? Going against the traditions. Yeah, there was a lot of things in there. And I was like, I, I don't know about this. And um, But that, that book um, led me... I was, I was just reading all of these different things, all of these different opinions and things during this three-year period while I was going to the temple. Then COVID hit, and I couldn't go to the temple anymore. And I was finding things on... I was finding Facebook groups. I just had this... I just wanted to know... Like, Something's out there! Yeah, I was like, is there, is there... Are there other people that are feeling the same way that I'm feeling about all of this? Like, something's wrong, and, and they don't know what's going on? And I found so many people, you know? I found there was... Um, just, like, on Facebook groups and things like that, people just searching. And uh, I found a Facebook group. It was called Doctrine of Christ. <laughs> And that is where I met Phil Davis, a man named Phil Davis. And I did interview him before too long. Yeah, we need to, you need to talk to him. Um, and he was giving he was giving podcasts on Zoomcasts. This is when Zoom started getting big because yeah. COVID, you know, COVID hit, and and then <gasps> no more people meeting yeah, in person. Yeah, Bring it exactly, online, exactly. And he was teaching Zoomcasts about the scriptures and. I just, and it was like scriptures, like I, it, he would just read the scriptures. Like, that's all it was. I was like, <laughs> like I could have, you mean I could have been reading these? Yeah, yeah. And it's like stuff you you never even thought about, though. Like, this has been here the whole time. Like, what? Excuse me? Yeah. <laughs> Haven't I read this before? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and that that was huge. I mean, I had some stuff that happened before that, before, but. Oh, yeah. Tell tell about, that's a good experience. Tell about, okay. um, you're talking about the prophet, yeah, right? Yeah, so. So with me starting on on my journey, um, journey as we started to recognize um, doctrine of Christ and things in the scriptures, we it, it changed the way I prayed and it, and it changed the way I sought to to connect and and f- seek out the Spirit. And so I started praying in 2019. I started praying and asking Heavenly Father, like Heavenly Father, please. Make me aware, r- reveal to me any idols that I have in my life that I'm unaware of. Like, reveal to me anything in my life that is, that, is coming between me and, and thee and anything I need to change. That, like, that's the kind of a prayer that we're not taught yeah. to be that yeah. introspective as Latter-day Saints. Yeah, and that was big for me. And one of the first things, I, I, I continued to offer that prayer, and one of the first things I had was, you need to stop watching TV. And <laughs> I was like, okay. And and one thing that I do, we have an elliptical downstairs, is I'll watch movies or shows while I go on that and or listen to music. And so I felt I need to stop watching shows, watching TV. I need to stop listening to music. So I started listening to conference talks. So I was listening to 15 <laughs> minutes of conference talks every day. And, you know, another one I had was I need to – would read these books for entertainment. I need to stop reading those books and all these time waster things. It sounds like you're, these time wasters your heavenly father my... wants access to your mind. And yeah, you know, exactly. You. Exactly. So I was cutting out all these things that I was using to fill my time. And instead I'm like, well, I can't read, I, I, I can't read books anymore. I can't watch TV. So I'll watch conference talks. I'll read scriptures and, and that's what I'll do. So I started doing that, um, for about a year and in near, uh, September, September 2019, I went to go get on my elliptical, and um, they had just done uh, Russell Nelson's birthday party for the church, <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I'll watch that. That will be my that must be spiritually, spiritually uplifting, uplifting <laughs> what I watch when I'm exercising, and so I put it on and expecting to be spiritually uplifted, and I started exercising, and almost immediately, like, you just... I just had this feeling like something is off, like something is very wrong here. And I'm not sure what it is. And 
you know, that feeling just kept coming and coming and I would think, oh, is it this? And then I'd start making excuses and try to try to make it right in my mind of, of what I was seeing and why it was distressing, like feeling so wrong to me. And so I'm having just a lot of noise going on in my mind, trying to figure this out. And then all of a sudden it was like, everything just went quiet. Like it just stopped. And I, and I heard a voice say, they have turned the prophet into an idol. And as I heard that, I recognized, oh my gosh, that's what this is. Yeah. But uh, other information came to me at the same time. Like I recognized that I had made an idol of the prophets, like not just, you yeah. know, especially with Gordon B. Hinckley. And I was guilty of that. And, and then I had King Benjamin's address just came flooding into my mind and just reviewing that coming over. And I recognize, I'm like, oh my gosh, what I'm seeing and what he taught, you know, what was given to him by an angel, <laughs> it, it, it doesn't mesh like this. It doesn't fit. It's not fitting with yeah. that. And so that was a huge thing for me. I wasn't expecting it. I wasn't looking for it. I wasn't seeking it. Um, it was an unknown idol that I had had and it was revealed to me and that just changed. And, and, and after that, it was almost like I could see idolatry everywhere I looked like I I started to recognize it in other areas and and things in the church and I was like oh my gosh like I I've, I've been surrounded by this I've been guilty of this and I had no idea and um then that started me taking a closer look at okay what what exactly is a prophet like and looking at comparing you know what I see from prophets in the scriptures to what I see um, from modern day. And I could look at Joseph Smith and I could see, okay, he has those same fruits. Like I can see he, he, you know, he, he prophesied. He was a prophet who prophesied. He was a seer who saw to translate the book of Mormon and he revealed things. He revealed the will of the Lord. We have it in the name of the Lord, in the name of the Lord. Yeah. But after that, I, I just couldn't see it. It wasn't there. And, and it sounds like you're not looking to be fault fighting. Yeah, you're actually no, you're I actually wasn't. presenting your I heart just, and mind like, to Heavenly Father, saying, "No, like yeah. I." And this it was just a thought that had never even come into my mind. It wasn't something I was looking for, and it, you know, just comparing the fruits, I was like, "Oh my gosh!" Like, and as I pray, I finally prayed about it and asked, like, you know, Heavenly Father, you know, does does he speak for you? Like, did you call him? Is he speaking your, you know, and I, and I got my answer and you know, and what is it? It wasn't what I was expecting. It was like, no, no, he's, he's, he's not speaking for me. And I just began. And as I kind of continued on down that journey and, and down that path for me, I just recognized, and, and I'm not saying this in a critical way or in any way judgmental, but like, this is just what I was, I saw, the, the church had kind of become the church of the Latter-day Prophets. Like. Yeah. Well, th there's something different because it, some things that I'm recognizing you, you're on your elliptical, let's tune into the broadcast of, of the birthday of President Nelson. You recognize dissonance. Now, most Latter-day Saints have been given the tradition, if something feels bad like that, that means you weren't supposed to be doing it. Yeah. yeah. But you think about the level of discomfort that Nephi felt right in the early chapters to where... He was commanded to do something difficult, slay Laban. He presented yeah. his heart and his mind to his heavenly father until his heavenly father talked him through it. This is why you're being commanded to do it. You're being led through things to where this is against your traditions. It's against your upbringing. Why did you feel confident in recognizing that this is the voice of the Lord unto you personally? And well, well, with that experience, like that didn't come from me. Like that wasn't even in my radar. That wasn't even my thought process. And I mean, I knew, I knew that that, came from the Lord. Like just the feeling that I had, how it, how I experienced it, how it came, that wasn't me. Like I knew that that and came from the Lord. Your insight right there, that it has become the church of the Latter-day prophets. As I've talked to my local bishop, my stake president, my father, especially their standard for righteousness has nothing to do with following Jesus Christ. Yeah. It says, do you follow those men? Yeah. And it's like as if Jesus Christ is pushed into the background to where he's insignificant in comparison to these men. Yeah, and 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 it was like once I saw it, it was, it was just sad. <laughs> like, it, and I did. I and and as I came to that, I went through this kind of mourning period. Like, um, what is it, all the stages of grief? <laughs> you know, 
And, and I, you know, I, I tried to deny some things like there was stuff Steve would say. And I'd be like, no. And I tried to make excuses and be like, no, no, it's this. And I would deny and, and make excuses. And then I was really sad. And then I got angry. And then finally, you know, like acceptance. And, and there was a point where I, as I was seeing more of these things and recognizing, you know, the, that we're pointing in this direction, we're pointing towards these men and we're pointing towards setting our own terms for our salvation and we're pointing towards these these idols and these things instead of pointing to Christ and we're not even aware that we're doing it. Yeah. Um, it, I, I kind of started, I got sad and then I kind of got angry. I was like, how dare they? <laughs> like, how dare they say that they're I, speaking I think for the Lord when they know they're not? At, and at the very least, it, perhaps at a subconscious level, maybe somewhat of a conscious level, I think we recognize we would have embraced the fullness of the gospel if we were taught it in our youths. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Did you rebuke your wife and say, get back on the path of the brethren? Nope. Uh, um. <laughs> <laughs> so it, you, know. so it, we, we, you had led up to all of a sudden you find a group called the Doctrine of Christ. You're hearing scriptures expounded in a way that you've never heard before. Your wife is having an awakening in conjunction with efforts that you've been led to by the Spirit. Yeah. yeah. All I wanted, all I wanted was truth. Like that's all I wanted. And from the beginning, I was assuming that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was the truth. I mean, to the point that that um, during those three years while I was at the temple, I would go running every day, similar to her, and I, I was listening to hundreds and thousands. I would listen to conference yeah. talks every day, hundreds and thousands of conference talks. And so I felt like I had, I had done my research. I'd done my research on the church and the Book of Mormon, and then we began to talk about the prophets, and we were like, you know... And this was all about the same time we we found the Doctrine of Christ group, which we didn't know anything about. I mean, it's 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 a brotherhood. It's just a bunch of people that have the same questions, and that's how I met you. And we we were talking about about the prophets, the 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 fifteen, and um, I was like, you know, this is right. Like they don't have the same fruits as the prophets in the Book of Mormon. They're not there. The prophets in the Book of Mormon and the prophets in the New Testament, they suffered and they died for Jesus Christ. Even Joseph Smith and his brother Hiram and Alma and Amulek in the city of Ammonihah, their kindred and their loved ones, they watched them be burned alive for Christ. And these men are being worshipped in football stadiums and flying around the world in private jets and are receiving salaries and and are wearing Armani suits and living very luxurious lives. And I was just, I mean, we both, we just saw it. And we were like, this is not adding up. If true prophets are what we're given examples of in the Book of Mormon and the New Testament, and Joseph Smith, then these people do not have those same fruits. And I like I can't unsee it at this point. I can't deny it. And I, I feel like I would be denying everything that God has told me and revealed to me if if I denied that at this point. At one point, you got called into a, uh, I think, a temple recommend interview, I believe it was your bishop and one of the counselors that were in there with you, that you... I think that was the first time that they heard from you. Oh yeah, yeah. That that all of a sudden you're becoming aware that all's not well in Zion. How? What was? What happened there? Line that up for us. So I had a, uh, you know, I had been awakening this whole time to the point where I was just like, oh, this isn't true. And it, I went. And, and when you say this isn't true, your faith in Jesus Christ is exploding and expanding. Yep, my faith in Jesus Christ is is exploding, like you said. My testimony of the Book of Mormon is greater and larger than it ever has been before. Same thing with Joseph Smith. I saw Joseph Smith as 
I mean, the man next to Jesus Christ for me. I mean, Jesus Christ, he's one notch. Un- he, Jesus Christ is the top, and Joseph Smith is one notch under that and has done more for the salvation of mankind than any other man save Jesus Christ. And I was beginning to recognize Joseph Smith as for who he was and what he really did and the sacrifices that he made. And so um, I... I didn't know really where to go with all this. I didn't feel comfortable paying tithing anymore. Um, And I didn't have a temple recommend. And I didn't feel comfortable answering the question, do you sustain Russell and Nelson as prophet, seer, and revelator? And so I didn't know really what to do. And then an opening came in the form of, like you said, a temple recommend interview. My bishop's counselor called and said, we'd like to get you and your son Temple Recommend interviews. And so I was like... And the fact that you're active oh. in the church, it should be like, yeah, stamp of approval. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. And and we're still going every week through <laughs> all of this, you know. So, so talk about what happened in the interview. So the interview, um, the interview, my son went first. And, you know, we've been talking to our children about all this all along. And they're like, oh my gosh, we see it. Yeah. They see it too. You know, they're the five, the six-year-old, she was five then. She, I mean, she didn't see it, obviously. She doesn't well, know what's going your, on. But. Your spiritual cohesion as a family yeah. has, has reached levels that it's never been at before. Exactly. And you guys are seeing these things together. Yeah, exactly. And and our kids, we're talking about, we're talking to our kids, and they're, I mean, it's blowing my mind that they are seeing it, but they see it. We're reading the Book of Mormon every day together, and... You know, we're just talking about these things openly, the things that Tamara and I are singing. We're talking about them with them and getting their opinion on what they think. And and they see it. They can't deny it. And so, you know, the Temple Recommend interview, he wanted to give my son a Temple Recommend interview and, and me. So I was like, well, okay. It's got to come out sometime. Let's do- <laughs> so in other words, you weren't going in there with the marching, let me let it out. It's a matter of like, okay, let's let's do this. Let's do this. You asked me, so <laughs> let's let's do it. <laughs> And um, so Thomas, my son, he went first and he said, you know, I said, just answer honestly. He's like, I don't know what to do. I said, just answer honestly. And question number four came along, you know, do you sustain Russell M. Nelson? And, and my son said, no. And he said, no, I don't have a testimony of that. And I think the counselor kind of justified that as well. He's 12 years old. He's 11 at the time. He's, he's 11 years old. And, and so he just kind of finished the questions with my son and, and, um, you know, then he went and gave him a temple recommend. Well, it was over Zoom, so he didn't give him the actual recommend then. Um, got to me, and, you know, I he started going through the questions, and, you know, one, no problem, two, no problem, three, no problem, four, yeah, there's a problem there. And I said, no, I don't, absolutely not. And he's like, okay, well, let's talk about it. <laughs> Physical expressions, eyes big, or was it just kind of like understanding he he's very he was very new and i don't think he knew what to do i don't think okay. he'd ever had that in a temple recommend interview before Espe- and, and one w- bishops in general right now don't expect it from active members of their ward yeah yeah and they want to be able to if somebody doesn't believe that it must be because they're not reading their scriptures they're not saying their prayers they're not having their family their family scripture studies or or family home evening now you guys are reaching a whole new spiritual level and he's confronted with this. So what happened? Um, so we sat and talked for about 45 minutes and I said, look, um, this is what I've come to understand. And I said, I don't think that they are prophets and seers and revelators. Absolutely not. They don't fit the pattern. They don't fit the mold. And I said, I think it started back with Brigham Young and we talked about Brigham Young. We talked about polygamy. We talked about the Cochranites and who they were. And I said, I don't think that Joseph Smith practiced polygamy. I don't think he did it. And I said, I think that Brigham Young is the one who instituted polygamy. And I'm telling this all to my counselor. And and I said, and who is an awesome dude? I was his home teacher. That's that's <laughs> when when I was when I was doing my home teaching. When I was seriously doing it, like he was he was my family, and you know his three kids, uh, Ash Ashley. Well, I won't say their names, but um, 
his his family like I would go like I would actually do it and so I was his home teacher for years and years and years and um you know I'm telling him all of this stuff that that I believe and you know about polygamy and I talked a lot about polygamy and the Cochranites and do you want to talk about that uh, no, we'll, 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 we'll leave that we, okay. you and I will probably you and I will probably do an episode that simply examines okay. it in depth okay um and I just said I I don't believe it I don't believe it. I believe the Book of Mormon, and I believe Joseph Smith is absolutely a true prophet, and I believe in Jesus Christ as my Savior, but as far as sustaining these 15 men, no, there's absolutely no way, and okay. I can't do it. Uh, describe as best you can, what do you remember their reaction, physical reactions and words said? Um, he asked a few questions. He asked a few questions. I did most of the talking. He just kind of said, well, when did all this start, and what... You know, he just kind of got into... Because knowing what local leadership is generally like, what they want to be able to say is, oh, you must have a pornography problem. <laughs> they, they, want, they want to be able to say something like that because there's no way that somebody following Jesus Christ is coming to an awareness. Yeah, coming to that conclusion. And the patterns are there. I'm just thinking of the patterns in the scriptures over and over again. Yeah. Those who follow the established religious leaders in chapter one of the Book of Mormon follow the religious leaders to destruction and enslavement. Yeah. Those who followed the established religious leaders in the days of Jesus Christ instead of Jesus Christ, they're led to destruction yeah. and enslavement. The patterns in front of us right now. Yeah. Yeah. And, okay. Yeah. You, you've got a calling in the ward at the, t at the time. Did they release you from your calling? What happened? Okay. So um, I didn't, obviously didn't get the recommend. Um, and he said, he ended and he's all, he's all, well, You've given me a lot to think about. And that was the last thing he said. And then I got a call into the bishop about two weeks later. And the bishop said, well, you know what this is about. And I said, yeah. And, and you got to understand, like I have been, we've been in this ward, like we said, for like <laughs> 17 years at this point. It's and, like you went from zero kids to three kiddos. Yeah. yeah. And I've been the elders quorum president. I've been the ward mission. You know, I'm I, like people know me in in the ward. They know our family. You're no you stranger. Know? Yeah, it, yeah. It, it, it would be. I bet you there's hardly any who have that same longevity in the same congregation. Yeah, there's there's a few there's a few, but not many. I mean, in the ward, a, a handful that have been here. You know, as long as us. Um, okay. You know what this is about. Yeah, you know what this is about. And I said, yeah. And he's also tell me where you are. And that. I kind of laid into him, and I'm sorry. Like I feel, I like I let him. I was like, just, just I, we know you feel sorry. Just give us yeah. what happened. <laughs> um, I just laid. I just went into everything that I had been learning and everything that I understood, and I read, you know, Helaman when Samuel the Lamanite. We read. I read a lot of scriptures, and I tried to. I'd been learning so much stuff. You know, I'd learned about what happened to the church and the church going into into apostasy and dnc 84 and forgetting the new and everlasting covenant and what the new and everlasting covenant is and um what the name change i mean the church used to be called the church of christ and then it was called the church of the latter-day saints and now it's called the church of jesus christ of latter-day why why is all this happening why are these name changes taking place trying to get into all of this with him and trying to give him uh an understanding of what is going on in my mind and I bless his heart. I don't think he wanted. He didn't. <laughs> what what yeah. percentage of attention do you think he was paying? Was I it mean, above the fifty percent mark? Or no, was just, okay. I, I just don't think he. It's difficult for them to. Pro well, we as humans in general, when the cognitive yeah. dissonance sets in, it is easy to tune out. Yeah, and and that's that's what happened. And um, yeah, it didn't it didn't go over great. And he's like he's like, well, I guess we'll leave you in your calling, and. <laughs> And that was, uh, when was that? That was probably, that was probably nine months ago. And so, and we continued to go, you know, every single week. We were there every week. And, and I know that since then, you guys are incredibly active having scripture studies and sacrament meetings here in your own home yeah. and helping others as they draw closer to Christ. Mm -hmm. Let me transition over here. Tamara, <laughs> did you rebuke your husband and say, you need to repent and get back on the brethren? No, I no. did not. What have no. things, things been like for you this last year? Oh, man. Uh, so, yeah, just, well, sorry. <laughs> uh, 
Well, I had my experiences and my eye opening. Um, and you're not a fault finding person because yeah. I, I know that's got to be it's got to be difficult when you recognize hard truths. Yeah, yeah, and and it was hard, and it did. It took me a it took me probably about a month to come to terms and finally like, oh, okay, yeah, I I can I can accept that, and and just as gosh, just it's. And, and I just want to point out, this isn't a matter of Steve trying to get you to see things his way. No. You're presenting your heart and your mind to your Heavenly Father, and you're recognizing instruction. Yes, yeah, exactly. And it just, all of this, like learning the doctrine of Christ has just filled me with a desire to come to know my Savior and just to be able to understand the scriptures and what I'm supposed to be doing. Like a lot of times, you know, my dad, I'd, I'd express, you know, I wasn't really happy in the church or I would be feeling this way. And it would be like, well, maybe it's because you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. And looking back, I'm like, oh, my gosh, she's right. I wasn't doing what I was supposed to be doing because I didn't know what I was supposed to be doing. I didn't know that how I'm supposed to be seeking Christ, how I'm supposed to be coming unto him. And and so now it's like, oh, I finally know. I finally see. And it's just brought so much joy. And and like he's, like he's saying, it, those empty feelings, it's like it fills you. You don't need anything else. You don't need football or TV or what you're, you're being filled by, by Christ. Christ. Yeah. yeah. And you don't and need the brethren anymore. Yeah. And it you have is, Christ. yeah. And it just, it just fills you and lights you and you, it's something that you just can't get otherwise. And, um, it's brought a lot of happiness, but it also, it's harder. <laughs> it requires In what ways? a lot more. You have to be willing to, give up everything like you have to be willing to change you have to be willing to have you know your family and friends around so you not understand th- th- and does your, get angry like as, <laughs> as your family has learned varying degrees of how you've woken up even though they might not view it as waking up um how, what has their response been well Why don't you go you go and then i'll go <laughs> my family i have a great family and uh, um, you know, my, my mom, she has been able to recognize a lot of the same things. And so she's just been able to be a, su- we've been able to be a support to each other and she can understand and see where I'm coming from. I think the rest of my family just thinks I'm crazy. <laughs> they love me, yeah. but, but it's they, probably easy for them to view 18 year old girl marrying an older guy. And she's just, she doesn't know what yeah, she's doing. It's yeah, easy like, for them to probably oh, yeah. explain it to themselves that way. Yes. Yeah. And, I, and I'm sure they think, Oh, well she's being led astray. Bye. <laughs> I think they do think that I manipulate her. Yes, um, yeah. Cause I, I, I haven't heard anything in this conversation, uh, about him trying to be the driving force yeah. and saying, view it this way. And you know what? In some things I've kind of <laughs> felt like, like <laughs> with some things I'm like, we need to do this or we, well, you know, you, you've, you've been a little bit more dramatic. So Steve, you've still got a calling and your, and your Bishop and others in your ward have no clue how to interpret your fervent activity, continued yeah. activity in the ward with your awakening that, Hey, these men don't represent Jesus Christ. Yeah. So I still have that calling. And I was still going. I was still going every week and doing my calling. And even into the summer, um, I went on about a, six weeks ago or yeah, about six weeks ago, I went on youth trek because that's my calling. And I went with my son and we both went and we had a great time together. Did you pull handcarts? We absolutely did. <laughs> yeah, we pulled handcarts together and it was it was great. It was very, um, throughout this, <sighs> relationships in my ward have been damaged um, between our family, and other families. What do you believe causes the damage? Rejecting their beliefs, rejecting what they consider to be sacred truths. And, you know... And, and is it is there any issue that is more at the top of these beliefs other than the brethren are God's representatives? Is there anything more important than that? That's that's it, right? That's the bottom line. That's the bottom. That's mm-hmm. and, that's, and you got to realize because I'm thinking about my own my own local bishop, and I'm thinking about yours as well. And my buddy, who's a bishop over in Sandy, I'm probably going to send this interview to him. Is there any excuse for not viewing it as idolatry? I know you guys are not looking to be fault finding, and I'm not as well. But what would be a clearer example of idolatry than putting these men before the Savior? Hey, that's what we see. Let's bring this to an end. I, I want to invite you, um, both of you, Tamara, if, if you would start us off, how has your testimony of Jesus Christ grown? And if you would bear your testimony of Jesus Christ today. Oh, man. 
like I said, it's just, it's like I had a tiny little seed and now it's grown <laughs> actually into something. And I, I love, I love my Savior, Jesus Christ. Like he's everything. And I didn't realize that until we started this journey, just how much I needed him, how important he was, how central he is to everything. Like I, everything depends on him and I owe everything to him. And without him, I am nothing. And I am just seeking to follow him and to do his will. And I still have times where I mess up, <laughs> but it's it's different now because whereas before I would feel guilt now I I feel that I forgiveness and and it's so easy to get back on track and it's so easy to he to follow him and to get back to doing what he wants me to be doing and I don't know it's <laughs> I'm just so so grateful for him and and I have gained such a testimony of the Book of Mormon like I never had before and such a respect and a love for the men who who wrote they they gave everything to the Savior they sought only to do his will they they sought repentance and everything they did they were guided by the Savior and they wrote the things that he wanted them to write and it's just such a beautiful gift and such a a tangible show of the mercy and love of our Savior that he would give us this and and his doctrine and it's all right there for us if we just have, to have eyes to see and um thank, <laughs> thank you so thank you so that, that is that is a true testimony Steve will you share your testimony and how it's grown of the Savior and, and your testimony of the Savior today Oh, I didn't even have a testimony of the Savior. Looking back, I didn't even have a testimony. I, Like I said, I had a testimony of the church. And my testimony of the Savior is that He is God. We can worship Him. We can love Him. Um, he, We receive our marching orders from Him and from nobody else. He's the bottom line. He tells us what to do. There's no man that tells us what to do. Salvation doesn't come by a man. It comes by Jesus Christ. And he is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. And his prophet is Joseph Smith. He is the prophet of the restoration. And I, I realize that and understand that to a degree. And who Joseph really is to a degree that I never even imagined possible understanding Joseph Smith and who he is and really what the Book of Mormon is about. The Book of Mormon is about entering into covenant with Jesus Christ. It isn't just a collection of stories. It is about kneeling down and seeking out revelation and receiving the revelation, and then acting on the revelation. Regardless of what those consequences are, regardless of if your entire neighborhood hates you, or if your family hates you, or whatever, if you lose your business, if you lose your job, if you lose whatever, it doesn't matter. It's about following Jesus Christ, down to crawling to him with nothing left, but a loincloth on you, on your hands and knees. And it is giving everything to him because, because that's what he requires of us. That's what he asks of us. And that's my testimony is that I know he is God and that there is no other way other than through him. He is it. He is the bottom line. And we have to seek him. We have to seek his will. Thank you so much, Steve and Tamara, for being on the Disciple of Christ podcast. Thank you, Jacob. Thanks.